This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the React Roundup podcast. This week on our panel, we have, let me see if I can do this uh, the native way, Lukas Heish. Perfect. <laughs> Good. I'm afraid, yeah. I'm afraid my Italian is better than my Portuguese. No, it was uh, perfect. Portuguese from Rio de Janeiro, perfect pronunciation. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we also have Nader Davit. Hello from Mississippi. Uh, we have a special guest, and that is Alex... Let me see. I, I know I'm going to blow this one too. Moldovan? Yeah, that's, that sounds fine. It's okay. <laughs> that's what I always get from the form. That, 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 that's fine. <laughs> you, you, you totally blew it, American guy, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm used Char- to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Um, I do want to get a couple of introductions. Uh, Lukas, you were on a few weeks ago as a, as a guest, and we've had a few panel positions open up, so I invited you to join the panel. Do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Uh, okay, uh, my name is uh, Lucas Hayes. I work for ZocDoc now as a senior front-end engineer, and we work on the patient-facing website. So whenever you hit ZocDoc.com, that's the product I'm working on now. All right. And Alex, you're our guest, so do you want to do a quick uh, intro as well? Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm from uh, Cluj, Romania. I work at, uh, at a company um, called Fortech as an engineering manager. Where I do a lot of uh, JavaScript projects with React, Angular, Vue, uh, mostly front-end, also some back-end. Um, I'm also um, one of the co-founders of JS Heroes, which is uh, the biggest JavaScript conference in Romania and also has an our community around it. It's like sort of like an international community <clears throat> since a few months ago. Yeah, I think that's in very quick words about me. Awesome. Well, we brought you on because I ran across this article on free code on the free code camp medium, and uh, it just basically talks about evolving patterns in React. And you you talk a little bit about how React has changed, and we kind of settled on some things. But I'm relatively new to the React community, and so my experience doesn't go back two or three years. And so I kind of wanted to talk first briefly about some of the things that evolved before I joined the community, and then we can talk about some of the patterns that you went into afterwards. So. The first one that I saw here was React.create class rather than using the ES6 class. And I'm not even sure what the difference is because I, I just, you know, I don't have that context. So I was wondering if you and uh, Natter and Lukas could help me ex- understand that. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I, I started working with React. Um, uh, let me remember what year was that. Uh, 2015, like just at the beginning, like January, uh, to get everyone like a bit of context on this. For example, Redux was released in June 2015. So that was like, uh, maybe few people actually remember the, like the pre-Redux uh, stage of, of React's existence. Um, I think it, it started getting popularity just in 2014, but like I think 2015 was actually the year with, when it really got um, a lot of, of community effort around it, a lot of attention from, from like the JavaScript community. Um, at the beginning, pr- probably the most the, 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 the thing that s- struck me most when, when actually starting with React was that like nobody had any idea how to actually build an application. We had this really uh, really cool uh, library for building UIs, but we were still in that phase where we were kind of like used to having these frameworks that will dictate your architecture, that will tell you uh, how to build like a, like a front-end web application. And React didn't have that. So uh, we, uh, I just remember like searching for articles and seeing something here, something there. Uh, I, I honestly don't remember now uh, exactly when like the, the current syntax of creating components was uh, was was f- like fully backed by uh, by the React core team, but when I started in in um, that then in 2015, uh, their documentation was uh, using this kind of like factory uh, function for for building your your components. So it was like React dot create class, and then you would this this was like a function call. It would return you the, it will return the component, and inside you would get all these functions. So you didn't have a, a class from which to start. You had functions even for like get initial state, if I remember correctly, and get default props. So all these were, were there in the, in the like standard API. And that was how the, like the official documentation was built. And at that time, there were many articles and many, many uh, resources around, um, around that syntax. So that was pretty much like the, the status quo back then for React. Gotcha. And then the other one that you mentioned at the very beginning is mixins. 
And so again, you know, I yeah, I don't uh, really know how that worked. So yeah, mixins were uh, kind of like the the first iteration of of for answering the question like how do I compose things in React? Like obviously, when people started building more complex components with React, they start realizing that okay, uh, this kind of behavior like for example, uh, listening for, uh, let's say, the, the screen size. In, I mean, we would do, today, we would do like in a component did mount, you would add the listener for, uh, for the resize event, and you would set that on the state, and would have it in your component. So you'd, you want it, sort of that behavior to somehow replicate in, in more components. Um, so mixings were, um, were sort of like uh, the, the standard way at the beginning of, of composing. And they were like, uh, they were based on this, uh, Pretty much, if I remember correctly, something like a simple object composition. So you would define your mixing as a as an object that had some some functions, some some it was holding some state, uh, and that would get uh, sort of like bundled together with your actual component uh, when you um, when you add that mixing to the component. So it's kind of like the I don't know mixing pattern. I think it's um, it's common, for example, in in Ruby projects to have that kind of composition. Or yeah, it's at, at least in Ruby, I, I was familiar with that. Yeah, I've, I've seen it in Ruby. I just didn't know if it worked the same way. So what do you think has replaced the idea of mixins? Is it like higher order components? And now we're seeing like render props. And um, now you can, of course, you could always really use context. But now we're seeing more prevalent talk about actually using context yourself instead of just using like libraries that take advantage of context. But like in general, like what is actually the new paradigm that's replaced the mixin? In my, in my mind, I'm thinking like a higher order component or something like that. Or maybe just a component um, that has like a child that renders with some type of... Um, you know, data or functionality that's passed down from the parent component of the parent class? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, I, I think, so the, the reason for my, my, my thought on, on building, on, on creating this article was actually on this exact chain of this evolution from like mixins to higher order components and to, to render props. And now I can even remember like you had these like specific uh, articles or specific references that everybody's pointing you to like, okay, uh, we were doing mixings at the beginning and then there was an article by Dan Abramov, like mixings are dead, uh, long live higher order components. Everybody uh, started jumping on a higher order components boat. Um, and then I think it was uh, Michael Jackson who uh, had an article and, 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 a, and a video on, on render props. And it was like, seemed like exactly the same thing, like hardware components are dead and our render props is the, is the way of doing composition. Um, yeah, I, uh, in my experience, I believe that it seems that we are going to a more like explicit uh, data route. Like in mix scenes, everything was like very implicit. From time to time, we had code that were calling these methods. We didn't know where it comes from. And then you analyze, oh, it comes from this particular mix scene I'm using and things like that. Uh, with with higher component, it seems that we went like a little bit more explicit. We have this in our tree. And with render props, we we're going like a new level of like, you can see in your actual like React tree, the data that you're using, it's there, it's dynamically uh, generated, and then you can use or not in your, in your, in your React tree. So I think maybe that's, th that's the route it is going from like very implicit with the mixins to more explicit with the render props. Yeah, I think so. Uh, probably, I mean, mixins were, were, were simple as a, as a concept. There wasn't anything magically happening there. It was just like, uh, object composition, right? But uh, I think what was what was missing was the fact that you had no idea where where the stuff that that you can actually use in the component is is coming from, and that's 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 the main drawback. Uh, and of course, you had uh, things like uh, name clashes. I mean, like you would define methods in mixins, and then you would have clashes from other mixins or yeah, whatever. I'm pretty sure a lot of people had a hard time just abusing mixins because it's it's, it's very easy to abuse them. 100 percent. I've been burned, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I've been burned only by the fact that I had to uh, create, recreate all, all the mixings into hardware components <laughs> and now slowly transition to render props. So, <laughs> I'm kind of curious, what about context? Do you ever use context in your day-to-day -day development or do you recommend people to do that? Or is it more along the lines of kind of the traditional um, knowledge of only use it if you like really have to or if you're building a library that, that really could leverage that, that power? My feeling, I mean, context at the beginning was sort of like, uh, it was in the docs. Uh, I think at some point they, they actually uh, sp specified there that it should be seen as an experimental feature or something that maybe only library or, or tool builders should actually use. Um, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of people used also context. And uh, I, I remember that uh, you, you had a lot of this uh, 
scenarios where you you wanted you wanted some more power than just your regular okay i'm sending props down this component and then this one sends down this and then i'm doing like state lifting and all sorts of these uh small tricks to 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 handle data and um yeah context would would solve that um but still the, the fact that like the, the docs uh, at some point specifically said like do not use this unless uh, you're building a library or unless you're doing unless you know what you're doing that's that's pretty much what it translates to me um i think it wasn't necessarily uh i think now for example when the new context what, what's that <laughs> uh i never knew you could do that but it, it actually it's, it's, it's kind of like the functionality is, is there it's almost like the same thing it's now just it's just um it's more in line with what we are using to build now with React, with the, the API we're used to now. So that kind of brings us to some of the new features that have been coming out uh, in the version between 16 and 17. We're seeing a lot of changes. Do you think like a lot of these changes are addressing some of this progression of how we, we're building React apps? Like I know um, that with Suspense, they're addressing the, um, the common pattern of having a component with some type of pre-rendering for a loading indicator, those types of scenarios. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on some of the new APIs that have been brought in uh, in, the, in the changes between 16 and 17. I, I feel that now for, for 17, like we're seeing uh, the, the library really evolving on, on, like on multiple uh, levels. It's also things, so there are also things like things that were brought in, in 16 that are, 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 uh, are getting more and more attention, like I know fragments and portals and stuff like that, which are actually like these small things that uh, get a lot of like these productivity things that you have to do. Like you don't have to do some sort of I know, ugly hack to, uh, to to have a, a like a basic functionality. I'm not sure what to say about about like uh, suspense API and all, all the new changes that we're we're seeing with the new lifecycle hooks. I think it's uh, sort of like slowly moving towards um, like a more predictable way of building components. But I wouldn't know. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily know how to compare with, with like what we have now, let's say in standard 16 version. I don't know if you, if you guys have any other ideas on that. I definitely think that the error boundaries that were kind of, I know that's not the newest um, thing that, were, that was added, but that's pretty interesting because, um, you know, a lot of times you would have an error and the entire app would just crash. Um, with error boundary, boundaries, it's a little easier to kind of like handle those errors. Um, totally with suspense, I haven't really used it yet, but it seems like it's going to be a good way um, to kind of like handle loading indicators and, and loading state just in general. Um, I'm not sure about the updated lifecycle methods. I never really use component um, will mount that much anyway, because um, I, after kind of, you know, learning more about React and building apps in it, you realize that it's, that it's not even something that's that useful anyway. You can do those types of, that type of functionality, you know, in other lifecycle methods. But I did use component will receive props quite a bit. Um, I'm still trying to kind of understand how to handle some scenarios there. Like um, if I have new props coming in, you can still return new state, but you can't call class methods because it's a static property. The new, um, the, up, the, the change um, is a static function. Um, I forgot the name of it, <laughs> but, but, but you can't call this dot anything. The only thing you can do is like return new state. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I haven't really used a lot of the new lifecycle methods because most of the applications I'm, I'm working on, we haven't upgraded yet. So it's kind of like um, everything that I know about it, I've read on blogs and seen in, in talks and stuff like that. Yeah, with the component to mouth, this is an interesting case because we do a lot of server-side rendering here. And component will mount runs in the server, and component did mount does not. So like whenever we have a data fetch that we want to happen in the server, we would put it on component will mount. Whenever we have data fetch that we only want to happen in the client, we would put on component did mount. So this change it actually like we were we don't know like how to to deal with this in the in the near future. We're still like experimenting with some ideas. What are the answers? Is it to, can you call these in the constructor? Yeah, this is what this is what we're doing. So it becomes constructor, and I thought that with the new ES seven or ES eight something, we could get rid of constructor because it's weird, like right, right. super and everything. So I really like to do like state equals and just start with the state instead of defining it on the constructor. And now we have the constructor back. So that would be the. Uh, once when you say you were like using the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no. no, please so, go ahead. So you had gotten rid of the constructor. You were using the property initializers, and now you have to go back to using the constructor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. These are the evolving patterns. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. It can be circular at times. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's I simple. think. I, I think that's an interesting segue back into this article. Um, you know, you you mentioned that uh, you know you've noticed that these 
patterns tend to evolve. And we've talked about some of these on the show at various points. So I don't know if we need to go into all of them at once. But one thing that I did want to point out is, yeah, where do you wind up seeing these sort of standardizer gel? Is it in blog posts or, uh, you know, Stack Overflow or conference talks or, you know, wh- where do we settle on these? Because it seems like once we settle on them, then we get the React team kind of adopting some of them and saying, okay, do it this way. I think normally it's a thought leader within the React community that just has um, has like a witty tweet or a witty blog post that everyone just follows. And, 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 and then it, the pendulum swings too far one way because everyone just starts adopting that new pattern regardless if they need it or not. And we saw that a lot with render props. Harder components are, are the best use case for a lot of things, but people started shoving everything into a render prop and, and getting rid of all of their harder components. So we ended up seeing things like um, one, one scenario is if you're using Apollo, um, they, have both a, they have both have a Howard component and a render prop now for their API, which is really great that they didn't abandon. But I did see an example of someone using a render prop for a subscription. And if you ever worked with GraphQL subscriptions, you know that there's normally um, quite a bit of functionality that happens there. So you end up having, um, instead of managing all of this data outside of your component, and then just using the data within your component, you're actually managing all of that functionality within your component now. So what, up, what ends up happening in that case, you end up with um, a lot of nested components with a lot of functionality happening within your UI component, which typically just, it just looks really nasty. And, and it, it just is better, in my opinion, um, outside of the component, like just handle all that functionality, pass the component, the data, and then let the, the component render that data instead of actually doing the manipulation and, and stuff within the component. So I think it's really in my, I mean, of course there's normally when, when a thought leader um, says something like um, he mentioned Michael Jackson saying that, um, you know, doing that blog post and that video or whatever around how our components are dead. Um, normally there's a lot of good reason when they, when they do something like that, because there's typically a lot of like consensus around a solution that isn't quite working for everyone so someone will come out with a better solution. But um, a lot of times people abandon like the things that we learned from that previous solution and just jump on board the new solution instead of saying, hey, this is good for some things, but maybe not everything. Yeah, I totally agree with this. And uh, the, like, the React community probably has, uh, I, I, I mean, it's, maybe it's just speculation. Maybe it's just the fact that I was very close to the React community um, but I see like a lot of a lot of thought leaders, like a lot of different opinions, and a lot of uh, a lot of people which um, are I don't know heavily followed on, on on social media. They do a lot of blog posts. They do a lot of uh, of materials like uh, online courses where they where they kind of like push these ideas. They push these patterns. Uh, so I think that coming back to to what I said initially, the, the fact that the like the facebook when when they they open source react and uh, i think before it even had like the like this notion of necessarily like the core team actively working with together with the community uh to, to me it feels like they said okay this is the framework or this is the library uh let's see what you can do with it and like the community took it and started like turning it upside down and doing all sorts of things and they actually learned from this so this is what, this is also part of this evolving process. I think the, the fact that uh, you you open source something, you you put it out to the community, and they go crazy on it, and they start using it in in, in ways you you can't even imagine. Like uh, at the beginning, like React was used in applications with Backbone, with with Angular JS, just as a as a as a fast like uh, like rendering library for just parts of the screen. And uh, I don't know, you say you, I I've seen. React being used as a as a PDF generator, templating engine, for example, and all all these all these crazy ideas from when people start uh, start really uh, they really they really are creative, you know, when when they have no like boundaries or rules or how of how to use it. Um, uh, but the, the the problem with this is that the, I think that uh, it also like overlaps a bit this whole. Uh, JavaScript fatigue that everybody was talking about like in 2015, 2016, a lot of it like we had ES6, nobody knew at some point what's like the standard language, how should I use it, we had tools like Webpack just appearing, everybody had, I'm sure everybody here had 
at least one nightmare day trying to configure Webpack at the beginning. Probably we still do even today. Uh, so yeah, this, this whole thing led to uh, people always trying to look up to others, like, okay, give me inspiration. What, how should I use this? What should I do? And, and whenever someone says, okay, you should use it this way, we take it as dogma. You know, it's, it's okay. He must know what he's talking about. Uh, I am definitely going to, to do it this way. So yeah, that's that's how uh, it, it's sort of like a, a like the whole community has a very uh, a huge like inertia. You know, when it, it starts moving into a direction, and it then it takes a while to to get it back on its feet if it's not the right direction. Yeah, and this this brings me uh, to a thought. Like I have a question uh, for you because uh, we are talking about rather like complicated. Like if you think about higher the component or in the props, these are like complicated patterns if you think these are solving uh, a non-trivial use case and the first uh, the first pattern you talk about in your in your uh, blog post is this conditional render that now we use the we we use the double what's the name of this character the ampersand <laughs> yeah the double ampersand and this is I think this is like the standards of the standards of the standards in terms of like conditional rendering. When, when, and how did you did you conclude that this was like, all oh, right, this is the pattern I'm I'm, I'm going to use from now on, and this is the pattern that the community is u- is using. How did you conclude that? I think for this specific one, uh, it's it's just like regular observation. I think it's it's. It's used by almost everyone in in tutorials. If you if you if you look online on courses or or any kind of video material that they do some live coding and they very this is a very common pattern like rendering a con- conditional re-rendering something. I think like probably one in three components has this <laughs> somehow. Uh, whether it's your loading like whether it's your loading a spinner or uh, or showing a spinner or showing some content or whether it's I don't know any kind of any kind of conditional rendering. Um, what I think that, uh, so, so like I said, this is just like observation. It's not necessarily, I don't think that someone needs to come here and say, okay, uh, people stop using, uh, stop analyzing conditions at the beginning of your render functions and then just using the result, just use this, uh, I don't know, Boolean uh, operation to, that if the condition is true, then it will render this uh, part of JSX. If not, it will simply uh, skip it. Um, I think this is just something that uh, it, it, it kind of like makes sense. I, I've seen components with uh, like five or six or even seven lines of, of code at the beginning of the render function. Or they all were doing like, if uh, this is true, then this is the class. If not, it's an empty string. This is like probably a very common pattern, uh, and it, it makes sense to try to 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 mitigate that to to not to avoid having all this uh, all this separation because then you look at your you look at your uh, JSX where you naturally want to see okay uh, what is the scenario in which in which I'm looking at the component now is it it has this state but what's like the JSX corresponding to that state and when you have all your computations above, you have to like go up, up, down, up, down, and just check. Okay, why? What is here? Oh, it's here. It's actually a line. That's twenty lines uh, in, in the upper part of the code. And so I'd say this, some some. Comp- I mean, if if I'm I'm to summarize this, and if, if if that's where where you want maybe to to get is, I think some of the patterns are are just common sense. So it, again, I wouldn't go, and I, I don't think in the idea of oh, this is the best. Uh, practice you should never use this right you can just argue that hey, look with this it it looks better it's uh, it looks i know it's maybe it's more maintainable it's uh y- you if you give it to a to a new person in the team um he or she will get it faster okay we'll understand what's happening there um th- so this is like this is like one one thing and the other thing is these patterns that actually evolve from debates and from from this whether it's a thought leader doing something or maybe just the core team pushing towards something because 
uh, yeah, probably now just to come back to the question to to the uh, to the React 17 features. I think maybe now it's maybe on not the first time necessarily, but it's it's a it's a time when the core team is actually pushing the the library more into a certain direction. For you, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Yeah, this is a this is a, a an interesting uh, moment. So it seems that the 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 core team was responding to the community, and now they are pushing uh, features. Is that is? Do, do you feel that? Do, do you feel this is a, a trend, or it's just another way of dealing with the same issues from before? It it might be also contextual uh, because the core team spent a lot of time. Uh, working on fiber, I think it like it was I don't know, two years effort. I, I'm not sure. I might be wrong with this. Um, so during all that time, we got some sort of incremental releases, but not with a lot of features because some of these features were actually uh, waiting for fiber to uh, to kick in, or were simply pushed to go together with with a fiber release, like like the fragment, like um, the error boundary, and now we're seeing more feature because. Simply, there's there's no more there's, there's no longer this huge project that Fiber was that that basically took the time of, of everyone in the in the team or yeah you know. yes it makes sense I wonder if uh, a new like classic React framework may be born out of the, all these changes of people saying like I like the old one I'm gonna stick and like fork it or something like that. I want my component to will render props. <laughs> component will receive props back. <laughs> I I'm pretty sure they they will receive a lot of pushback when they start like actually removing the deprecated uh, the deprecated life cycles and things like that. This is this is really interesting. How do you how do we evolve a framework like you uh, you're talking about evolving best practices? The framework itself is like a image of some best practices. How do we evolve? Like, do do they do they conform to the use cases they have inside Facebook itself for their big application? I wonder, like, how this uh, this feedback occurs and how much this influences them having that huge internal application using the framework itself. I don't think that that's the case. I think that their their process is pretty transparent, so it's not some not some sort of like hidden agenda by Facebook to try to bring the framework in or the library to some sort of place. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question. Like, do you, uh, do you, is part of the evolutionary process of a, of a library or of an ecosystem is, is also like, uh, creating breaking changes as we, as you move further, is it, is it part of it or should you avoid that at any cost? And it's, it's a good, I think it's a good question. I, I, I particularly like a lot the way that they change things by, uh, first of all, deprecating and like first they have warnings and then they change the names, but it's still there for like one, two major versions. And then they start like after a lot of time. So it, 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 all the libraries have time to to migrate. A lot of things that ha that, that happen from time to time, like when you had like a Angular breaking change or something, is that like your calendar component does not work anymore back in the days, yeah, things like that. So I think that they are they 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 do even though they are doing a lot of breaking changes, they it's like a smooth sailing. It seems like they they do this well. And I think what like fundamentally, I mean. 
I'm not sure exactly what the definition of a breaking change. Probably the fact that it's not part of like the uh, the API, like the standard API. Probably it is it is considered a breaking change. But even like when they removed create class, uh, there's a, there's a separate package for that. So there is a path to okay. It it might be a breaking change because if you just update uh, your npm uh, dependency, yeah, it will break. But there is a, a, a package through which you will smoothly transition without that need. And it shouldn't take you like less, more than I don't know, a few hours, let's say, to, to make sure everything is in place. Yes, yes, this is true. With prop types, the same thing. They did not deprecate, yeah. but they removed from, from, the, from yeah. the main library, right? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll see a package that's just a like, component will. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're right. Component will, uh, will, uh, will mount, right? <laughs> You're right. Why not? Yeah, I wanted actually to. Um, uh, you mentioned something like, uh, and also mentioned before, like the idea of of uh, of best practice. And I think this is something that is very. Uh, for me, whenever someone says this is the best practice, is like a very. Uh, it's, it's like the absolute truth, and I, I I don't really think that's that's the case. And I think um, the the people have this. Uh, in the React community, the developers are are sort of like very, uh, I don't know, perfectionist. I would say they 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 really they need to have their the best practice, you know, implemented in their project. If it's not the best practice, it's I don't know obsolete or it's not. <laughs> uh, it, it's I don't know. It's it it's simply uh, is is this this common um, or, or a constant run for for running for the best practice where. Actually, there are, like there are these good practices out there, right? It's it's not necessarily a thing that this is one is the best. Like between render prop and hardware component, come back to that. I wouldn't necessarily say that one is better than the other. They are both good options for composition. Uh, there are cases in in which one is better, cases in in which the other one is better. Um, it's up to you to to make that choice. But uh, sadly, I see that uh, a lot of people need to somehow have the choice done by others others to tell them this is the best practice this is how you have to do it you know mm -hmm. yeah and i i always like to to give like one two steps back and try to understand like which project are we talking about right which deadlines which team size like if you have is it an application that is going to be running for years in production with like two three teams working on it or is it like uh Three week project that needs to to go out and no one will ever touch again. So you have like completely different design patterns for both cases. The, both cases are equally valid, and some design patterns work better in one situation. Some some does some work better in the other situation. Uh, there is uh, one uh, pattern in your in your post the the props spreading the props that uh, we had some, some issues when we do that a lot because you kind of lose control of like what's entering, what's not entering, uh, my component, what's, what are the inputs and the outputs I'm, 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 I'm dealing here. When you do it with like a very long-term uh, application, sometimes this can be problematic. When you need to do something really fast, just pass around those props because we need to build an application a, in a really agile manner, this company is like a, a, it's a startup that needs to prove uh, hypotheses and concepts and stuff like that. This is the way to go. So, of course, one pattern will be super valuable in one scenario and won't be uh, valuable in another scenario. Like I won't be using a lot of like reusable, super generic, high order components if I am in a long term project that teams will change. On the other hand, if the team, if, if it's the same people uh, dealing with the same project over and over again, then you can have some more complex thing because these people learn that more in depth. So it's like, yeah, the, the silver bullet argument, I think it, it touches like we always have to, 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 under, to understand like what kind of project are we talking about, what kind of uh, team and what kind of company are we talking about. Well, one other thing is, is that I see best practices has kind of been co-opted into and even cargo culted in some ways into software. 
but usually where you see it where it means something, it has more of a legalistic definition where you're talking about something like medicine or construction or something like that, where they have a best practice and it's almost a legal defense, right? The bridge collapsed, but we followed best practices, so it's not our fault. And in software, everything is moving so quickly that I just don't think it really has any meaning. Even if we could make the case, hey, look, render props are always the right way to go until next year when we come up with something new. And so, you know, I, I hear people talk about best practices and, and all I can really say on that is, yeah, you know, we're going to settle on some patterns that work better than others. And I think we're seeing that in this article, but you know, we, we see things moving so quickly in the React world, the JavaScript world, the software development world to our next year that may be completely different. Like it's just these other fields that moves much more slowly. And so it's, it's much less helpful to talk about um, best practices than it is to talk about trade-offs. And then we can talk about trade-offs in a year. You know, we were doing it this way last year. Here's a trade-off between that way and this way. And then you can determine, you know what? We're trying to stay afloat. We're trying to keep up. And guess what? we don't have time to go back and redo everything with render props or with higher order components or with whatever, right? And for right now, the trade-off doesn't make sense for us. And then in another year, okay, now we're really getting to the point where it pays off. That, that, that's, that's great. It makes me wonder if there are thought leaders in the bridge building community. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know, but the real answer is, is I don't care. <laughs> people say like this this old type of concrete let's throw it away and things yeah. like that i wonder yeah i think i think yeah we should learn a lot uh, with these other communities that are building stuff that really do not break and <laughs> really do not fall that would be interesting i think there is stuff for us to learn there but yeah um the the way that they evolve and the way that we evolve are completely different and, and I also like that you talked about trade-offs. This is, this is key. Nothing is free. Whenever, whenever there, there is uh, those blog posts about best practice and not only like uh, transmitting knowledge about a pattern, they say like, this is, this is the way to go. Uh, the other way is like complete garbage. There's always a flag. There should be like a flag there. Like this is, you should actually describe the trade-offs. We all know now that Nothing's a hundred percent better than uh, than the other thing. Like oh, globals. We should never use globals. But now everything's about context. So now is it global school again? Like so, <laughs> context is, is is a way of using global stuff in your React application. So there's a trade off. So it's always talking about those. Mm -hmm. I think this is more constructive than then actually say like this is the best way to do it or or anything like that i think this is an interesting point yeah totally and i also uh think it's, you touched an interesting point earlier uh that it it also matters a lot like what's the context of the project like is the same team building the project for like three years are are they getting used to working together so they kind of like know this patterns that they they know that they are using on the project but maybe someone else joining the project might have a hard time doing that or is this project just handed over from one team to another and then you get everybody starts rewriting stuff every six months because uh the others did uh, um did a crappy job or something you know it's uh, it, it there are a lot of there are a lot of these variables into into the mix so uh, coming back to, to 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 my previous point, uh, I, I really want to uh, I really want to see the community moving more towards uh, these are the good practices. To put them on the table, mm -hmm. so then you can pick whatever uh, you know it's best for the context of the project. You know, have like this. Okay, let's have a one week break. You know, in in the like in the whole development process and and think this through like. This is what like anyway, this is what software architecture is about, right? Taking a step back, looking at what you have, looking at the context, doing all the trade-offs, doing all the math, and saying, okay, we should move towards this. We should add that. This is something. I, I feel that people maybe not they they don't have that. They don't they, they don't see the result of the projects. Right? They're just typing every day, doing new features, new features, new features, refactoring, refactoring, and yeah, it's leads to these problems. 
I, I kind of have a, I kind of have a question or maybe a topic that veers a little bit away from kind of what we've been talking about, but it's also kind of in the same subject matter. And it has to do with data architecture. We've seen how React has kind of moved from the initial days of Flux to Redux, and we have MobX as was thrown in there around that time. Um, now we're seeing GraphQL and people actually saying um, to move away from Redux unless you really need it. Um, I'm kind of curious, what are you know, your thoughts on where we currently are with data architecture? And kind of also, have you worked with GraphQL and where does GraphQL fit into that? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, to, uh, about the Redux thing, it was even funnier that when the new context API was announced, I think someone wrote an article that, oh, you, have to, you can now remove Redux because we have the context API. And everybody says, no, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were speaking about like trying to influence people with this kind of like uh, maybe short-sighted ideas. That, oh, yeah, that's the best thing now. <laughs> um, yeah, Dataflow, uh, probably th- this was not necessarily in the scope of the article, but it definitely followed similar patterns. If not, I think it was even uh, probably... Th- it's like you could even write a book on how data architecture evolved in, in React. Um, like uh, Facebook had the Flux idea, but nobody like knew, okay, what the hell is actually Flux? Like, is it, there was no, it, it wasn't a library. It was more like a model that you would copy paste everywhere and you would write uh, a ton of code to, to, to make this happen. Uh, then there were like, at times, like 20 different implementations of Flux. Like, uh, I remember in, in one of our projects, we started, uh, we started with Flux and then we realized, okay, Flux is actually just creating a lot of code. So let's try finding out a library that does that. Remember, this was like pre-Redux. So then it was Reflux, which was uh, one of the most popular at that time. Uh, and as soon as Redux started uh, developing, Reflux stopped being developed. So, the, so we, like we had to maintain this uh, application for more than six months because uh, with with no new features in Reflux, we had to like implement a lot of custom code oh, uh, just to maintain that. Because uh, yeah, people just moved to Redux, but we already had a running application that we couldn't change like that. You know, um, and I, I, I'm sure that a lot of other other companies and other projects experienced this similar frustration with the, with the React ecosystem at the beginning. Everybody was abandoning the project that yesterday seemed like the obvious choice. Uh, so yeah, then Reflux, then it was Redux, uh, then MobX, MobX also appeared. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's now to uh, also to like the similar, it's definitely in the similar position as with like hardware components and render props and these kind of debates. Like we have multiple ways of doing kind of like the same thing. Uh, here's where Redux is best. Here's where Malbex is the best. Uh, and here's where GraphQL is. Um, if, uh, if, I, if I look now, for example, at, at the same project that, that we have, which, is, um, which has uh, a lot of uh, API calls, um, and everything, all the data flows through Redux, right? We, we build this very... Uh, simple abstractions on top of Redux with some middlewares doing uh, data fetching. So we just dispatch actions, which we say this action is async. So that action does the dispatching. The, uh, that then it dispatches another action when it the uh, when data is 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 coming back from the API. So it's all working. It's the architecture is there. Uh, but now we realize that okay, we're we're writing a lot of code just to to bring some data into the into the system, which is like a simple a simple fetch, which can actually be done. In a render prop, for example, or it can be even done in my component did mount and just kept as a state. Um, so GraphQL is interesting because uh, if if you jump on the GraphQL boat, uh, you kind of like stop seeing the need for uh, an immediate state management library um, because like local state is, is should be still kept in the in the component. That's another story, like. People doing everything like stop using set state because they had Redux. This is another <laughs> uh, another bad uh, if you want a, a bad practice of abusing uh, best practices. It's actually a bad 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 practice in the end. Um, so yeah, uh, coming back to to the point, if you have GraphQL, uh, all of a sudden, like a good chunk of the applications don't necessarily need another state management library because 
in, in a lot of cases, like you do with state management, you just do like uh, sort of like this caching store thing that holds all the data and fetches some more data from the API, maybe does some pagination, maybe some sort of minimal logic. But um, actually today I read a very nice article on, on GraphQL on uh, Apollo client uh, link. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm... Um, the, the idea that in Apollo 2 now you can um, you can use uh, in parallel with like your server queries you can actually you can also keep data in the Apollo cache and you can query that data through GraphQL so you're basically then you definitely don't need anything else like Redux or Mobex to, to keep local data or to keep yeah local state so I, I don't know what I don't know what what like what would be uh, of course it's not a, a, a question that has like a yes or no answer yeah, yeah graphql is now the best we have to remove uh, <laughs> everything else but it's yeah, really it's it's really exciting conversation that we were having earlier about dropping things just because something new yeah. comes out <laughs> yeah quit rust quit it <laughs> yeah. we are uh, here at talk talk we are we are using uh, we have a, a graphql endpoint now and most of the of the queries we're doing, like to grab information from a doctor, grab information from a hospital, things like that, it's all, all via GraphQL. So the main profile page, search page, it's all consuming information from, from GraphQL with, uh, with Apollo client and Apollo server. And I have to say that a lot of our Redux work was, we, we, could, we could remove it, we still have it that like we couldn't remove completely. Uh, I can see if you go like full GraphQL in your models and stuff, they, the, the, the Apollo client deals really well with like optimistic updating and stuff like that, but it's, it's like a huge commitment to, for it's, it's a lot of work for, for a big company to just say like, okay, let's put everything in GraphQL in this next, I don't know how, <laughs> how much time. So just by, by, by fetching it from, from this different, uh, from this different from, for this particular uh, data sources, the, the profiles and search and stuff like that, our code is, is, is relying less in Redux now, but we are far from, from being able to say we don't need this anymore. So I guess what I'm hearing is you're still using Redux, but you're also using GraphQL, and you're using like Apollo as your client to, to manage state. So I'm guessing, so are you using Apollo link state? Or are you yes. just a managing state like as it comes from your, um, from your GraphQL server and then using the Apollo cache to kind of manage that using optimistic response? Yes, uh, yes. We, we only do queries. We don't do mutations. So okay. like in the server, we have a GraphQL higher order component that, that fetches, for instance, the search, uh, the whole search and hydrates the search inside the GraphQL itself. We render the application in the server. It, uh, the interesting thing is that it puts the, 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 the results in, the, in Apollo cache. When it goes to the client, it doesn't fetch again. So it just rehydrates the, the application really quickly. So that's, that's an example of a use case we, we're having now. And the same for, for a profile page. Grabs all the information from the doctor, renders the page. Put the, the cache in the in, in the window in a window object. When it when it gets to the client, it gets from from the memory cache, and and renders really fast. So, but we still have Redux from for like a bunch of things. So yeah, it's like uh, it, 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 it's interesting because I think most of the applications. Uh, I, I don't have a statistic backing this, but I think a, a good chunk of, of, of applications are in, like, the, the, their main purpose is to get some data from some API, to send some data to some API, and to, to handle some sort of UI interaction. And so, like I, I was saying, so Redux and all the Flux-based libraries, uh, they all went to uh, solve the problem of data flow on the client, but there was no, like whenever everybody was asking like okay how do i do api calls but nobody asked like why should they do api calls through redux it's just something that we automatically say okay this is the state this is not 
uh, any kind of data is not concerned to uh, is not related strictly to the to the to the UI, right? It's data coming from the servers, like business logic. So we know our separation of concerns. So UI is UI. So business logic is here. So then naturally Redux deals with business logic, but the the pattern itself was not necessarily for that. It was just for uh, for for data flow uh, in the application uh, outside the context of the of the components, but not necessarily uh, not necessarily for business logic, not necessarily for caching data. And GraphQL definitely does a great job at at reducing the the co the amount of code that you have to write to get data to the client or to send data from the client. Yeah, and and it's definitely great when you have like multiple APIs to to build your view model and things like that. You only fetch from, from one place, from, from the client. And I, I, I've already worked also like in, the, uh, in, a, in a project that it was the first project after migration to microservices. So the, the client was like reaching for, I don't know, 12 REST APIs endpoints to build... Oh, no. Yeah, to build uh, the view model, and we were like becoming async programming wizards <laughs> because of that, and running like gigantic, super smart Redux sagas to be able to do that like properly, and right. yeah, definitely be able to do this like on the server with GraphQL in a more sane way. It 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 helps a lot. All right. Well, I'm gonna push us to do picks. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash dev chat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. Nader, do you want to start us off with picks? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I have a couple of picks, I guess. Both of them are around AppSync. It's the GraphQL service that I kind of work on at AWS. Um, and it's a combination of a blog post and then a GitHub repo. So the blog post is a blog post that I put together and I just released today and it has its own GitHub repo and it's called Building AI-Enabled GraphQL Applications. And um, with, with AWS AppSync and um, a Lambda function, you can pretty much do anything, hit any, any service and kind of use a GraphQL query or mutation even to kind of interact with like pretty much any service you can think of. So in this blog post, I use GraphQL and AppSync to take a sentence, translate it into a given language, whatever the language the user would like. And then it takes that language and then synthesizes it into a, a voice speech MP3, stores the MP3, returns the uh, reference to the MP3, and the user can use a React Native app to play it back. So it's all within like 50 lines of code and it's using AppSync and I'm pretty stoked about it because it, I was really um, having a good time writing it. So um, it's called Building AI Enabled GraphQL Applications. It's on the Open GraphQL Medium publication. Check it out. Um, my second pick is awesome AWS AppSync. Um, again, this is around AppSync. It's a GitHub repo where we um, put together all of the references around AppSync, documentation, tutorials, videos, all that stuff, um, not just from AWS, but actually from the community. So it's open for pull requests if you are um, interested in, in submitting something. Cool. That stuff just looks cool. So, yeah. Lukash, what are your picks? All right, uh, my pick today is this tool I've been using for, for the last years. It's called Speed Curve. To, we've been doing a lot of performance optimization work, and they just do a wonderful job like showing the breakdown of your website, and you can follow 
uh, through through the history and get up the tail. They have beautiful dashboards. We don't we don't lose like almost any time like building dashboards. It really helps us. So this is my pick. Nice. Um, I'm gonna throw out a couple of picks. Um, I've been playing a game on my phone and iPad and stuff for a while called Star Realms. And it's a card game. And you play it with the cards. And uh, anyway, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's a deck building game. So, you know, you buy cards as you go and stuff. Um, it, it resets every game you play. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. And I don't know if I picked this on this show before. It's hard to keep track because I do like eight different shows these days. <laughs> um, but uh, another card building game that I've been enjoying and you can play, I've played it with adults and really enjoyed it. And I've played it with my kids and really enjoyed it. Um, it's the Harry Potter Hogwarts battles game and the game mechanics are fun, but uh, you know, you start with year one, the game mechanics are exceptionally simple. And then as you build up, then it gets to more stuff. So anyway, I'm enjoying that as well. Um, I did enjoy the books and the movies, but, uh, and so that helps with it too, right? Cause you, see stuff from the movies um but anyway um yeah those are going to be my picks alex do you have some picks for us um uh, i haven't prepared uh prepared for this uh but if if i were to think uh, i assume so it, does it have some sort of uh condition or is it just something some exciting things that we are... anything you like yeah um there are two things at the moment that get me very excited uh in <clears throat> this whole thing one is uh, also in the realm of, of, of GraphQL and is the whole work done uh, behind uh, GraphQL and Prisma, which I think are really awesome services. I mean, GraphQL itself is like, uh, if anyone wants to start learning GraphQL, they can just spin up the a GraphQL server in like just a few seconds. Uh, with, you, they can just write their types and they have already all the all the. Uh, all the functionality of a fully fledged GraphQL endpoint that they can play with in, in a front end app. So that's something that that really it really amazed me, like how 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 fast the whole GraphQL community went with evolving this all this tooling and all these libraries and and frameworks around. Um, and and Prisma also is very very interesting in that in that matter, but I, I haven't given it a try yet. Um, but it, it definitely looks like something that we're going to hear more about in the, in the upcoming years. We had Prisma on our show a couple of weeks ago, actually, if you want to check that out too. That was, that was really interesting. He's, he's really, really sharp. I'm a big fan of him as well. Yeah, so Prisma, so you had it on React Native Radio? No, we had him on, um, I believe we had him on like as our second or third guest on React Roundup. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, um, yeah. We, Nicholas we also, Burke. Yeah, we also had uh, Johannes Schickling from Prisma on JavaScript Jabber. We interviewed, we interviewed him as we speak last week. Um, this episode should be going out at the beginning of July. The episode for Prisma on JavaScript Jabber will be going out mid-June. So go back a couple of weeks and you'll find it. You'll find something there too. Because we were talking, they had just done their, announced their uh, round of funding and the, yeah. the change in the name of the company and stuff like that. So. You can get all the details there, and we dig in a little bit more on how it works. So, but yeah, we did do it on this show. Awesome to hear that. Really looking looking forward to hear it also. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, uh, one one other thing which I really I'm really excited about is TensorFlow JS, uh, which uh, probably a lot of people already heard about that. Um, I'm I'm honestly like close to. Uh, complete noob on everything related to like machine learning AI really looking into uh, getting more up to speed with this but tensorflow JS really gets me excited about all the all the cool things that you actually do now in the browser uh, and I have like a bunch of uh, just side homeworks to try out um, with it so yeah that that would be one thing definitely awesome now one more question that I want to ask is if people want to see what you're working on these days or, you know, anything like that, I'm assuming you're on Twitter and GitHub and maybe you have a blog or something as well, or maybe you just always post a free code camp. I don't know. Do you want to just talk about where people can find your stuff? Yeah, definitely. On, uh, on Twitter, I'm, uh, I'm all about JavaScript and tech. So, uh, people can follow me there and they can uh, ask questions or can just, uh, start interacting there. Um, 
I also, uh, I, I don't do a lot of, uh, unfortunately, I don't have that much time for a uh, lot of open source, although I would like to. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, say the GitHub is a, is a place. Uh, and yeah, for, for blogging, uh, I use Medium and I usually publish on, on Free Code Camp. Awesome. Uh, and I have a, lot, a, a bunch of other articles which uh, if people want to read and give some feedback. Uh, some of them in the React ecosystem, some of them are just generic about like front-end development or full-stack development. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, thanks for coming and uh, sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate that. Sure. Um, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. And we will catch everybody next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. <laughs>